in 1 Corinthians, we've been looking through this book, and of course, um, we've come up on uh, a number of different issues that are in this congregation. And again, as we uh, go to chapter 11 tonight, another question being answered by the Apostle Paul. So let's stop and have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Lord, we do ask that you would help us tonight especially. As we open up your word, that you would challenge our hearts. Lord, allow the principles of your word to change us, to make us more like the Lord Jesus. Lord, even tonight as we study your word, I pray the Spirit of God would uh, effectually work in the heart of the believer, uh, challenge perhaps any unbeliever that might be exposed to the message, and that you'd receive glory in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you'll remember, in chapter 7 of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul began that by saying, concerning the things that you wrote unto me. And he would not really go back and write the question. He didn't go back and say, here's what you asked. They knew what they asked. Paul just answered the question. Now we read it and we begin to determine what was it that the question was. Now if the Spirit of God had thought it necessary for us to know the question, then certainly he could have recorded it and it would have been inspired and we would know that's the case. But God required or put it down in such a way, and my personal opinion is the reason it's put down this way is some of the things that Paul was dealing with beginning in chapter 7 all the way through the end of the book was going to be somewhat related to some situations that were going on specifically in Corinth. Now, had the question been given, and Paul had said, by the way, you asked me this, and he wrote it, um, then we would have thought, well, it only applies specifically to that particular question, where really the principle applies to the church of all times. Do you remember being in school when you uh, had homework and you were asked some basic questions about your reading, and the teacher said, write the answer in a complete sentence. Now, this is Bible for why we shouldn't have done that. It can confuse people, okay? You kids agree with me, right? Just give the answer. I always hated writing complete sentences. Got a couple of teachers looking at me with a scowl on their face now. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, Paul didn't write the question. And I think the reason the question is not there. Now, with that being the case, there are some passages when we read chapter 7 through the end of the book that admittedly can be on face value what we call difficult. For instance, when we read chapter 7, you read through that passage and he clearly implies that men and women ought not to get married. But obviously that didn't mean all the time. It meant for this present distress concerning the question that you asked me, and we read the context and we realize, okay, what he's talking about was the deep persecution they were going through. For that particular time, it wouldn't be best. On the other hand, he did not prohibit them from doing it. He gave them basically advice based on that. Now, from that, we pull some principles. We realize some things that he says in that chapter, principles that do apply to us, but it was related to that custom. Now, when we come to chapter 11, I introduce it that way because this passage in the first part of this chapter, there is, there is disagreement among good people as to how this is applied. This is one of those passages that is sort of like the passage over in the book of Acts, for instance, when the apostles came together waiting for the day of Pentecost, and they realized that Judas had fallen from his office, and they determined they were going to vote in a new apostle, and they voted in Matthias. Matthias is never mentioned again in the Bible. Later on, the Apostle Paul is an apostle called out of due time. So there are plenty of folks who believe that, that the Apostle Paul was the replacement, that the apostles really jumped ahead of things, that God didn't honor that. There are other people who believe very much that Matthias was an apostle because after all, the apostles voted him in. Uh, he must have been an apostle. We just never heard anything else about him. Look, when we get to heaven, we can ask Jesus if Matthias was an apostle. Um, there's other passages, for instance, when Simon uh, was saved in, in the city of Samaria, it says he believed, and then Peter comes and says, I believe you're in the gall of bitterness. People have said, well, surely if he was saved, then he still was, and uh, why did Peter you know, not know that? Again, those are narrative passages that God records accurately and that we pull principles out of. Now, you'll know when we begin to read this passage exactly why I'm introducing it this way, because I want to be careful to understand when I interpret the Bible, I want to interpret it in light of its historical context. We do this all through the Bible, and I've talked about this before. God did not introduce terms that did not exist. He did not bring up historical events that had not happened. But he would prophesy so that when that historical event took place, it was clear this fulfilled it. 
When, it, uh, when, when something happened, you could say, well, the, I mean, the Bible was read for 2,000 years before we ever got it. So people of every era, era rather, would be able to get from it and glean what God had to say. Now, this particular passage, the first part of this, we're going to move to the second part. But when we look at the first part of this, I want you to notice carefully how it's worded, and then you'll see where I'm going with this. Look at verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, continue and answer these questions. It says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, you notice he sets up this passage by saying, look, there is a subjection of leadership. I'm an apostle, but I follow Jesus. The only thing you know about really Jesus is what I've taught you because there was no written word. He was the, the, the apostle. He had the authority. And of course, God later recorded this in writing. But essentially, he says, look, I'm not God. You're really following Jesus, but follow me because I follow Christ. Listen to what I tell you. Now, that's a great principle, tremendous principle to understand. We ought to follow the Lord and what he puts in this book, but it has everything to do with what's being written now in the next passage. He says, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So he has actually given them a commendation that, yes, the things that I've told you, you do recognize that they're God's word and you do fall in line. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now the first head is this head. The second head is his head, the Lord Jesus. So you see, if he has his head covered, he dishonors his head, which is the Lord. Every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Her head is her husband. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. And the idea of power there is authority, a demonstration of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man and the Lord. Now I read that passage and I, you understand Paul is writing, answering a question. And certainly at face value when I read through that, it seems to be fairly clear. Paul says if a man prays or prophesies and he has his head covered, then that would be a dishonor to his head, which is the Lord. He's showing a lack of subordination to the one who's in charge of him. It says if a woman were to pray or prophesy and she were to have her head uncovered, then that would be a dishonor to her head, which is her husband. She's showing a lack of subordination to him. And so you know, of course, there has been different takes and there are plenty of folks that, and it's less and less and less, but there used to be a lot of people when they came to church, a woman would have her head covered. And it was absolute taboo for a man to have a hat on, really inside of a building, but certainly in church. I mean, that's uh, really part of what this is based on. Now, if you read that at face value and you were a woman and you said, well, you know, certainly uh, it seems like God's telling me to wear a hat. Well, first of all, he's saying when you pray, or prophesy. He's talking to the church. Well, then we stop and we think, well, is a woman allowed to prophesy? That means preach, by the way. Um, she could pray, but this has the idea of publicly. But see, there, there is public ministry that was allowed in the Corinthian church. It didn't mean they were getting up and preaching in the pulpit. But do you realize any time that a woman shares the word of God in a public way, she's sharing the word of God. She's prophesying. If she praise, and certainly she has the ability to do that. Now, what we do is we go to other scriptures, and we find the context in which she's willing or able to do that. That is, who would be in subjection to a woman? She is standing in authority over those people. Well, other women. People, kids, for instance, that would be younger than her, she could have authority over. So when she's to do that in the Corinthian church, Paul said if she did it with her head uncovered, it would cause dishonor to her head. She would be showing a disservice to her husband. And sir, if you get up and pray or prophesy in your context and you wear a hat, you would cause dishonor to your head in the Corinthian church. Now the question that comes to us is, 
uh, was Kimberly in God's will just a few minutes ago when she was singing in front of the congregation. Well, if I didn't think so, I probably wouldn't allow that to happen, right? Uh, this morning, somebody taught children's church. I don't know if it was a woman or a man. The person didn't wear a hat. Are we just ignoring this part of the word of God and say, well, I don't like what that says, so I'm not going to do it. Well, undoubtedly, there are some good men. My favorite teacher at college, and I think he was the only guy at the whole school that believed it, he, he was a pastor of a church, and he actually did, and he only required it when women sang in the choir, when they taught Sunday school, when they sang a special, whatever. He required it. They had to wear a head covering. I respected that, listened closely to what he had, but, uh, said, but I also noticed other men that equally knew the Bible didn't take that position. And of course, I myself have studied this. Now, I'll admit to you, there's some difficult parts here. For instance, verse 10 for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, I've heard about three different positions people take on that. A couple of them are a little bit outlandish, but it's very unique. That's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. I believe probably it means that she should demonstrate the authority of her husband because we're reminded that the angels tried to rebel against God and it was a sign of rebellion. Some believe that the church over our angels watch and learn from what takes place in the church and so forth. If you want to clear this up, Brother Mike Haynes, after the service, meet him in the foyer and he'll tell you what this passage means, okay? Now, the fact is, there's some, passage, some difficulties in this passage, but let me, if I could, my, my temptation would be twofold. One temptation is to look at this and say, well, I don't understand it, so it must not mean anything. Um, the other side would say, well, if we pass over this, and it seems like we're not going to adhere to it. How do we pick and choose what we're going to adhere to? Well, now, we're going to adhere to what God says. There's principles here we need to draw from. I bring back your thinking to chapter 7, where clearly, because this is a passage where this side is not clearly as taught, in chapter 7, we know clearly God's plan for marriage. Okay, And yet he says in that chapter, it's good that a man not touch a woman, with the context of, what do you mean, Paul? Am I supposed to say single? It's good for a man not give his uh, daughter in marriage and so forth. Well, Paul, what are you talking about? Surely God wants people to be married. So what do we do? We placed it in its historical context and realized, oh, there's a deeper principle. I believe that's precisely what we have here in this chapter. Now, let me give you a couple of uh, passages here that are, show you what I'm talking about. Look, if you would, down again in verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. In verse 6, he says, If, for if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Did you notice in no part of this does Paul prohibit the, the, the lack of the head covering or the head covering? He doesn't prohibit it. He says, if you do it, it demonstrates a lack of authority. The problem was demonstrating a lack of authority. Now, I contend, and I think if you also look down at verse 13, he says, judge in yourselves. Ask yourself this question. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Let me ask you a question. Do you think it's a problem for a woman to pray unto God uncovered? And you answered that question inside. I would dare say that most of you said no. But it was for them. Because in their day, there was something obviously that took place. And we can see this even, you know, Muslim nations are living about 800 years behind civilization. And undoubtedly, it was a little bit like Bible times. And certainly in Corinth, there was some element that was associated with men, women that were married having their head covered. And women that were unmarried or maybe loose living women, they walked around with no head covering. It was associated in that, in that way. You can read it into this context. So in Corinth, when they, when they read this, they certainly understood, well, when they came into the church, obviously they, were, they realized they were free in Christ. They realized, no longer am I tied to this idolatrous culture. I really don't like wearing this hat anyway, and so I'm going to just throw it out. And Paul says, now wait a minute. First of all, why did he get the question? He got the question for the same reason we have the question today. Women were saying, do we really have to do this? Men were saying, is this really a problem? So Paul writes and he says, look, in Corinth, where you live, you know how society views this. You need to be very careful to send the right message. 
Frankly, I think our culture has moved on from this idea. I don't think the lost world in our day views women wearing a hat as subjection. They don't look at it that way. They did here. Notice what Paul says in verse 16. Again, a little bit difficult passage, but what it seems to say, he says, if any man seemed to be contentious, well, no doubt this question that they wrote, there was a contention. There was an argument over it. If any man seemed to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, I would take from that that what is taking place in Corinth was actually unique to Corinth. He says, look, if, if there's a real problem in this, it's calling a big deal. Do you realize this is a very small thing? The churches of God don't really have an issue with this. And we as the apostles, we don't really address this anywhere. So what was taking place was kind of uh, unique to Corinth. But here's the thing that I need to do. Okay, well, that passage means nothing. It's just dealing with the culture of that day, and it doesn't matter. No, there's a very important principle that we shouldn't overlook. Now, here's the problem. When you get to a controversial type passage, one person, a good man, says, look, I just believe everybody comes to church, a lady ought to have a hat on, and that's the way it ought to be. And, uh, of course, we don't have a lot of problem with the men not wearing a hat, because sometimes you do. But even then, it's only when you pray or prophesy. There's no prohibition here about a man wearing a hat inside of a building or inside of a church. It's when they pray or prophesy. What does a person do when the Pledge of Allegiance takes place? A man takes off his hat. But I don't see women putting one on. See, we don't have a custom similar to this now. But I'll tell you what problem we do have that this passage addresses. We have a problem with the distinction of the sexes. We have a, a serious issue in our culture that has been overlooked by preachers, undoubtedly, because it's our responsibility to teach there is a difference between a man and a woman. Now, first of all, you have the order of creation laid down here. Look back, if you would, in verse um, 5, or, I'm sorry, verse 3. I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, not every Christian man, every man. This is not talking about the church. When you talk about the spiritual aspect of the church, when you talk about eternity, when you talk about uh, our relationship, not talking about everyday life in, in, in general, we're talking about our relationship with the Lord. The Bible says there is neither male nor female, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, we're all believers. We're in Christ. There is no difference in that. But in creation, which by the way, we're still under as long as we're in this human body, in creation, it is Christ, the man, and the woman as an order of rule and an order of authority. And that translates to what? To the home. Uh, as a daughter, uh, just like a, when, when they're young, of course, they're the son is under his uh, dad's authority, but the son becomes his own man, starts a new family. A woman is under the headship of the father, and even chapter 7 deals with that. And then she goes, gets a husband, and she's under the headship of the husband. There's not an inferiority about that, but it's God's way he taught it. I want you to look for a reference here. Just look over, if you would, for a moment to 1 Timothy. Well, this is dealt with similarly. Of course, you know um, you're familiar with the chapters in Ephesians that talk about the husband loving his wife and the wife submitting to the husband, but we're talking about really even the headship of the husband here. Somebody is supposed to be in charge. God's in charge of man. Man was put in authority over his home. Okay? I'm not a, in authority over every woman, but God has placed a woman in authority under me. He says in verse 12 of this chapter, 1 Timothy 2, 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Talking about in the public ministry here. Not to usurp authority over a man. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, my objective is not simply to make an argument here that women and, and get on women and say you just need to back off and you need to make sure you're listening and make sure you're subjective and so forth. I really, if I was going to do anything, and I'm really not going to preach on this tonight, but I'll stop and say it, men ought to take leadership. 
You know, if a man is the right kind of man, takes the right kind of leadership, probably most of the time women are cut out to follow them. Most of the time that happens. A man earns respect by the way he carries himself and so forth. Obviously there are exceptions, but a man is responsible before God. So I don't think a man's going to be able to complain much before God and say, look, I tried to take over, but she wouldn't let me. Well, isn't it implied in that that she was in charge? I mean, so yes, that's as far as the family's concerned. But here's the thing. Why is that the case? Because God's making this case. There is a difference in a man and a woman. There's more than just mere biological differences. There is a difference. A man and a woman are both human beings, both equal, love, equally loved by God. There's no difference in that, but their position before God, their purpose is a little different. Now, this kind of hits on it. He says, Adam was first formed. God made a man. He didn't just equally go ahead and just make a woman the same way. He took the woman from man. There was an implication in that. Then he says that the Adam was not deceived, but the woman was. Now, we sometimes give uh, Eve a, a bad rap. Oh, well, look at her. She's the one that caused the whole problem. No, she was actually deceived. Adam wasn't. He was actually more responsible than Eve because he wasn't deceived. Now, the devil recognizes something that he doesn't want the world to know. He knows there's a difference in men and women. Now, you know that yourself. We understand it. But you realize today there's very little biblical ground and teaching on this. Think about this for a moment. The devil looked at the woman and he looked at the man and he said, hmm, I'd really like them to fall. I'd like them to sin against God. So he came to the woman and he approached her how? He approached her on a logical basis. He dealt with her mentally. He came to her and he said, look, hath God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And she said, well, he said we couldn't eat it, we couldn't touch it. Do you sense a little bit of a, an emotional reaction? Almost, he, he got her to think about it, got her to focus on it, and she emotionally said, we can't even touch it. Well, God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He began to logically lead her in the wrong direction and say, well, look, if you follow this logically, God doesn't really love you. If he did... He wouldn't want you to not be like him with the knowledge of good and evil. He's holding you back, and he left her. She started meditating on the logic of it, and she said, hmm, I think he's right. Well, you know what? He was wrong. She got fooled. She was deceived. Well, now he says, you know, I know how I can get Adam. If I go to Adam and I say, Adam, yea, hath God said, you shall not ever tree of the garden, Adam would have stopped and said, well, no, that's not what God said. God actually said this and this, and he's provided this for us. We're doing just fine. If he'd have come at Adam first, logically, the implication is clearly Adam wouldn't have listened, and he wouldn't have got him. You know how he got Adam? With his emotions. See, Adam isn't all that straight with his emotions. He doesn't know how to follow discernment. He doesn't know how to follow the sixth sense. When his wife came to him and uh, had those big you know, crocodile tears and said, Adam, I've just been wanting some of that fruit and I just like it. Well, he threw out logic and he said, okay, I'll do it. You see, he had a weakness in his discernment. He had a weakness in his sense. In that sense, the woman had a weakness in logic. Do you know men and women are made differently? Now, I always love it when I say this because I know what you're thinking in your mind. Men operate mostly on logic. So you say, well, what are you implying? Women are illogical? Next passage. No, oh, no. <laughs> no, that's not their go-to. Women can be logical and men can be emotional. But their go-to is their sixth cent. The man's go-to is his logic. Now, you know what we need? We need both. If the man looks and says, I'm just going to approach this from a logical standpoint, he's overlooking something very important. God has gifted women with an ability to see things in a way they can't see it. If a woman just simply operates on her I emotion, I feel like it, I just know it'll work, and the man's got logical reasons why it shouldn't, she clearly ought to, well, let me stop and think. He's approaching this from a logical standpoint. That doesn't mean that women are never logical, men are never, you know, impulsive. Certainly that's a generalization. But the point is they are different. Now, what's wrong with our culture 
is they want to claim that there's no difference. That is an affront to a holy God. I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 22 for a moment. We go all the way back to the law. Do you realize the majority of the law, many of the things that you read, perhaps you read through the book of Deuteronomy or the book of Leviticus sometimes, and you think, well, why did God go out of his way to, to give these specific examples about not uncovering the nakedness of this particular kinfolk? And why did he say you don't want to eat this particular type of animal? And all these specifics, well, what they did is they specifically dealt with what the heathen of that day did. See, the heathen nations lived a particular way, and they, the Jews well knew what he was talking about. They knew how the people in the land of Canaan lived, and they did some of these uh, perverted acts and things. And he's saying, when you're, you're going to be different, you're going to be God's people, here's some things that you're going to do specifically. Now, they already knew some of the things were wrong, but some of these. Now, here's one that he mentions, because no doubt the heathen nations were following this. He says in verse 5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. You know, there's some things I read in the law. And for instance, he says that an that a ox and a donkey are not to plow together. I read that you can't sow divers' seeds. Now, we don't think today twice about uh, putting two different kind of seeds together and producing a hybrid plant. We know that was for the law that was illustrated, the separation of the clean and the unclean. There's a purpose behind it. But there are a few times in the law where God says, for instance, it's an abomination for mankind to lie with mankind as with womankind. Well, yes, that was written in the law, but if it was an abomination, it's always an abomination. Now, some of the things were an abomination to them. They wouldn't apply today. We're not under the law. Uh, for instance, he said, if you eat um, certain kind of meats, it's an abomination unto you. But it wasn't an abomination unto God. But this is one of those places where he says, this is an abomination to the Lord. Now, who would have thought? I mean, most of the time you read through this and you think, and of course, you can, you can make some application. There's certainly application that we can make in our modern day. Even among um, believers, a man ought not to dress like a woman, and a woman ought not to dress like a man. That sends a message. But imagine, even back in the land of Canaan, you had people who were transvestites. Men trying to dress in a woman's garment. Do you realize the devil's always been active? And he has always had an agenda to confuse people about the sexes. Because you know what it does? It, it starts off, it's a cycle. They get confused about it, and they send a message to the young people, and the young people take it a step even further. Now, I grant you, I, I have changed in this, and um, it's, we live in such a, a crazy world. But I used to, when I, oh, back in my 20s, I would, and it was so unusual to see, but I'd walk in and I'd see, let's just say, for instance, a woman who was trying her best to convince you that she was a man. They never do. I mean, they just look like a, a freak, okay, for lack of a better term. You know what they're, I mean, you're like, okay, you've got nobody fooled. You've got your hair cut like a man, you're wearing men's clothing, you're doing everything you can to try to look like one, and, you know, no respectable man would face you as a nose guard if he was a sinner. I mean, you just, you know, you're just not. And I used to be like James and John when they were with Jesus. God, would you, did I pray that God call down fire from heaven? I mean, that is wicked, I tell you now, when I see people like that, I pity them. I really do. They're lost. They're clearly lost. I don't know if they got molested. I don't know if they sat in a college classroom and got their mind twisted. I don't know what kind of home they came from. I just know this. They don't have Jesus, and they're lost. I'm compassionate. I'm still wrong. I wouldn't try to, by any means, curb it over and say it's okay, but they need Christ. But I'm telling you, we live in a society where that doesn't happen just every once in a while. It probably would be likely, if you, if you went shopping this Saturday and you walked through a, a busy place, you're going to see an instant or two of that. I mean, it takes place. And it can take place the other way as well. It can, it's not as prevalent because I guess just the way men are cut out, it takes a lot more uh, audacity for a man to dress up like a woman and so forth. Um, I don't know why that's the case, but you just see it more the other way 
But these people are lost. But the only way they're going to recognize their lostness is if we stand for rightness. It's not going to happen by being accepting of it. It's not going to happen by saying, well, that's just the way these people are. They're born that way. You're right. They are born that way. I was born to be an adulterer. Thank God I haven't carried it out. Um, they, they might have been born that way because they're born sinners, but it's still wrong. Now, our young people need to understand that the more feminine a woman can be, the better off they are. The more masculine a man can be, the better off he is. What is the, you know how the world views masculinity. They think masculinity is being mean and gruff and hard to get along with and nobody can tell you what to do. I don't see Jesus like that. I see Jesus as a man who was firm in his conviction. I see an uncompromising soul who was willing to turn over the changers of the money's table, but was also compassionate on a sinner that wanted to come and put ointment on his feet. A true man. You know what a true man is? It's somebody who follows the will of God. Man, he, God decided what a man ought to be, and that's what a man is. Hey, what about a woman? You know what femininity is today? To be uh, sexually overt. Oh, well, that's feminine. No, that's lust, and that's wickedness. Fem femininity is when a woman is ladylike. I mean, not to be more like a man, but to be more like a woman. The feminine side of women and I understand in the Christian context, we, we're not as, as far as the world is, but I'll tell you what, the world's gone so far, we feel comfortable following at a close distance. I mean, we need to take a stand for it. Now, you know, people get afraid when I turn over to Deuteronomy 22.5 that I'm going to preach on women wearing pants or something. Listen, I mean, that is an application. I understand people have used that application. I, that's part of the culture. That's, I mean, that's, maybe that, that's a lost cause, but they're still, don't lose the cause of being feminine. Don't lose the cause that it does matter, not just modesty, but distinction matters. That we're distinct in our dress, uh, distinct in our demeanor, distinct in our attitude. I am, I'm not going to say it that way. I'm going to say it this. I am a man and I want to be a man. I started to say, I am a woman, and I want to act like a woman. So, uh, I'm not, okay? <laughs> and I don't want you to be confused about it. Now, understanding that, that's what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He was talking about there's a structure. There's an authority structure, and it ought not be broke down. Go back over, if you would, to chapter 11. And I don't claim that we're, or chapter 12, yeah, chapter 11. I don't claim that we're going to solve every issue of this passage. And certainly I uh, could concede that some folks may read this, may come to some different application. But I do believe that there's being an, a, a definite um, principle laid down here that they, you follow the line of, of, of authority that God has laid down. Why? What was Paul really worried about? Think about it again in context. He says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. He didn't say don't do it. He said, but if you do, you dishonor your head. Every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Uh, if a woman be not covered, let her be shorn. And if it be a shame for her to be shorn, let her be covered. What really is at stake here? Paul says, here's the issue. I'm answering your question. He says, here's what you, haven't, you need to consider. Whatever your custom is, and he seems to be saying to me, well, we don't even have a custom like this, but I do want you to handle it, and I want you to do it because you do have that custom, and I want you to follow it. Why? Because your testimony is at stake. People are watching you. There is a, there's people that are looking to see what kind of message you're sending. I mean, the bottom line, and what I don't want to lose here, is that he is telling people, how are you viewed in the culture in which you live? I'll tell you a good principle to be able to take. As you, if different cultural issues come up and you wonder about how to make the application, give God and not the devil the benefit of the doubt. You just give him the benefit of the doubt and say, I'm going to take, go the extra mile to make sure the world knows that I'm the gender that I am. You say, well, that's ridiculous. Everybody knows. Well, yeah, you do. And if there's one thing that's not going to catch on, if there's one thing the devil's never going to succeed at, is making everybody a man and everybody a woman, He's not going to do it. It's a, a somewhat of a, a, a trend and a fad, but it's been around for a long time. It's going to have its high points and its low points, 
but there's only one place on this world where people are going to find the truth. They're going to find it here. And we are the stewards of that truth. So may God give us a testimony to the world. Let's stop there tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight.